Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst and today I'm speaking with Lev Harris, who is a true crypto OG and the founder of Rotkey. Um, Rotkey is an open source tool for accounting and portfolio tracking and management that focuses very much on privacy. Before I chat with Lev Harris, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain or a business looking to white-label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Hey, Left Harris, it's good to have you on. Hey, hey, Frederica, nice to, nice to be here. We had you on, uh, incidentally, for the first time um, on the 10 year. Um, epicenter episode because kind of we talked about kind of whom would you, we like to kind of have on who's a true OG who's been here forever and your name was very much at the top of the list and kind of we reached out to you and he said you're super happy to come on but it's a little bit weird because you've never been on before so here we are to make up for that. Left Harris you've you've been in this ecosystem literally since since the very beginning um T t tell me about your background and how you first entered the space. Yeah, so indeed, I've been here for quite a while. Um, I entered the, the crypto space first, like by mining some Bitcoin back when it started, but I lost the oh no hard drive. Yeah, it's well, it's happened. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, like for real though, I I, I got interested when I was uh, in Berlin uh, looking for a job because um, I I had um, I had a job at uh, Oracle GmbH, which is the the, the big American uh, Oracle, the, the the giant, and it was really boring, and I just wanted to do something fun. And then I saw an ad by Gavin Wood uh, for um, uh, the Berlin Ethereum uh, office that was just starting to work on on. Uh, on this thing called Ethereum, and I was like, okay, that sounds interesting, let's go. And so in 2014, I joined the FDEV, so the Foundations Development Arm in, in Berlin, and started working on, um, what was it? Mostly mostly on Solidity, basically, because I was really interested in compilers. I had even written one, it's still in GitHub, and of an early version of Rust, uh, but before Rust existed. Yeah, I started working on, on Solidity, and... Uh, then later a bit on the C++ client, which uh, uh, unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. And uh, yeah, this is how I started the, the trip into Ethereum. And this was literally before before the Genesis block, right? So you started at the end of 2014 and Ethereum went live like July of 2015, right? Yes, that is, that is correct. What was it like back then? Because kind of... Um, 
if you kind of look into the Ethereum space now, and I mean, we, we say this all the time, it's still early and so on. But back then, kind of, it was like literally very, very early. Um, how did you guys kind of see Ethereum and kind of how did you feel about the prospect and the chances of Ethereum making it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, hmm. So I thought it's a game. Back in the beginning, I was like literally thinking it's just a fun game. Let's see how it will work out. We were t playing in the testnet and I remember um, like double spend bugs or suddenly uh, <laughs> money appearing in some account, etc. It was all just fun and games. I, I didn't really realize the scope of what we were building until um, maybe DEFCON 1. Because um, that's when I actually saw the interest by outside people because as you know so there was in, in uh, like so i started the, like uh, either third or fourth quarter of uh, 2014 and we had defcon zero in november so q4 2014 and that was in berlin in the the very first office that that um was in the uh, waldermastrasse and there there were only 25 30 people all just geeks working on ethereum and i was like okay this is like a meetup and it really was just like a meetup. The only outsiders that I can remember was probably Golem. Some people from 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 the Golem Foundation. Well, then it was not a foundation; it was just you know a project. Um, and it was just people talking about how awesome Ethereum is and what 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 we are doing. But other than that, there was no. It was very difficult to actually see how this would be applied in in the real world uh, later, because there was no other. Um, developed a smart contract platform back back, back then um, as i said so this slowly started changing uh, from the release and until devcon 1 because you started people seeing uh, you, you start to see people um, use it like deploy smart contracts uh, make first dapps and yeah that got really interesting slowly yeah so uh, devcon 1 was then in london about um, a y three quarters of a year or so later right yeah, uh, probably November again uh, in 2015, yeah. That was shortly after Ethereum had gone live in July. Um, and then kind of um, you, you stayed at the Ethereum Foundation until the end of the year. And then you moved to Slockit. Um, <laughs> and you only you only spent like eight months there or something. But um I mean, now we remember Slocket mostly for the DAO, or almost exclusively for the DAO. Um, tell me about wh why why you decided to move over to Slocket and kind of what the promise was. Well, I mean, so the reality with with Slocket is that um, back in um, there was a lot of drama in in Ethereum Foundation back in uh, DevCon One um, because they were running out of money. Um, uh, they had spent already too much of the money that was raised. And the uh, so Ether wasn't doing that well, or at least they were spending more than they had. And uh, so the FDev um, uh, leadership basically decided at the moment to just fire everybody. And so everybody was fired back then. And this is how I ended up in, in Slokit. I just was looking for another job. For the firing, it, it got undone afterwards and there was a change of leadership and people actually ended up staying but i had already accepted an offer to go to slokit and and went there so what was slokit supposed to be um so uh, christoph jens uh, one of the three founders of slokit um he was um advertising in devcon um even in devcon one like this ethereum computer that would be this kind of um hardware that we would build and this is what i really liked the connection between hardware and the software world where you would have it in your um in your home and you could control various things via blockchain transactions and the the famous or infamous thing right now that also gave it its name the slow kit it was this smart lock right and they have this demo and we we also saw it later in some other events where there is this lock that you do a transaction on mainnet even because it was a bit cheaper back then uh and the transaction gets mined and then the um, ethereum computer sees it and unlocks the um, the lock the idea was you know you would uh, do a airbnb kind of style of um uh, renting an apartment and uh it would all be on the blockchain and uh, verifiable and all that um 
and I got really interested in working on this Ethereum computer. Um, because uh, I'm still a bit, but back then I was a lot more interested in, in uh, a very low level um, uh, backend, uh, um, uh, backend stuff. So it was supposed to be written in C and all that. Um, but what they ended up getting famous for is how to fund this thing, which they announced also since DevCon 1, that they would fund it through what they call the DAO. Uh, and um, it's not like what they do right now, like uh, everybody makes a DAO that just airdrops people tokens and uh, they have a foundation somewhere in the Cayman Islands and then they uh, have the lion's share of, of that token. It, it was a really pure uh, and maybe naive idea that you would create this uh, DAO that would be an investment vehicle that would invest in many product, uh, yeah, projects, products, including the Ethereum computer that Slockit would make. But it would be completely up to uh, anybody who participates in the DAO, so everybody who, who puts money in, in order to um, uh, decide if they would ever um, end up uh, funding Slockit. So this fundraise was actually incredibly successful, right? Ba basically, back then, there wasn't actually all that much you could do on Ethereum. Um, and so like 15% or so of all ETH actually ended up in the DAO. Um, sometime, I think kind of they started their token sale in April or so. And then, but by June, um, the contracts had been hacked and you were very much at the forefront kind of w when that happened, uh, you and Griff and, uh, and uh, a couple of others. There's actually really good coverage of this and also kind of like the Ethereum Foundation situation that you alluded to earlier in Laura Shin's book. I think kind of you were one of the main sources for that book. Do you think it's it's accurate? Yeah, yeah, it's very accurate. At least for the stuff that I was that I was involved in, it was very accurate. For the Ethereum Foundation stuff in Switzerland, I can't attest anything about this because I, okay. I, I never went, uh, actually never went to the Swiss office. Ah, okay. But yeah. all the drama that affected Berlin and all that, uh, yeah. Okay. So tell us about the hack. What happened and kind of how, how did it go down kind of like from, from a first person perspective? So th th there is a lot of uh, background to the hack, like the um, uh, problems that were found with the um, uh, idea of, of the DAO that it could uh, split to other uh, uh, sub DAOs. And you could um, uh, exit the DAO essentially by saying, "Okay, I want to, you know, like they have now in Moloch DAO, the rates quit. You can just uh, quit and take your portion of the funds that you put in into a sub, uh, like a child DAO, I think uh, they called it." Um, and there were lots of game theoretic problems that some people uh, suggested, and they even had to call the moratorium to the DAO so to stop it, but. Uh, you can you could not pause uh, the, the 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 DAO. It, it the, there was no admin key. There was no pause button. It it was impossible to stop it. Um, and so this uh, fateful day, I don't remember exactly, but somewhere in June, um, in the morning, I just wake up to Griff's call telling me that the DAO is being drained. And I'm like, what, what, what? Good morning. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> and uh, yeah. So what ended up happening was that um, there was an exploit. Um, that was found, that was a recursive call inside uh, this um, uh, exit of the DAO, like like you take your funds and, and go, um, but you could essentially drain the, 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 entire, the entire amount. And um, yeah, so it happened that it was being drained. We tried to understand what's happening. In the first uh, hours, I think, I managed to recreate it in the testnet. But at the same time, it, they stopped. So whoever did this stopped for whatever reason, we don't know. And they had drained something like 30% around, I think, of the DAO and 70% was left. And then we were like wondering what to do now because I had recreated on the testnet and had the contract to white hat hack it. But um, yeah, there were questions because we was a member of, of uh, Slokit back then. Uh, so should we do this as Slokit? Should the, 
do it as someone uh, anon? Uh, should we not do it at all? Is it legal? Is it okay? Uh, and so we were really just not doing anything for the first days. And we were really scared about what, what the implications. What, what would that mean? Were you worried that someone else would recreate this? So basically, even if the kind of the initial hacker, I mean, they got they got thirty percent of um, the DAO, uh, DAO ETH, but um, in, I mean, basically, it it was clear that there was an exploit, and kind of there were probably not all that many, but probably on the order of like ten or twenty people who could have just recreated this. Yeah, yeah. So this is exactly what worried us that uh, copycats would eventually pop up, right? It's, I mean. Once you see what happened, even if so, I recreated it fast because I, I I I had also written part of the contract, right? But if I took a few hours, someone can do it in like double that time or a day, and it did it happen like a few days later. Uh, there was the start of copycat attacks, and there was like two or three sub DAOs being created. It, they, they were kind of sloppy because they probably didn't do something right, and they were they were starting draining very small amounts because it really. It was such a funny exploit because it really depended on how you write the contract. You had to be very careful to put some parameters correctly. And also how much... So you needed uh, capital to run it because you essentially are running capital through the DAO to drain. So the more you put in, the more you could um, take out. So in the end, at some... Like, I don't remember how many days later, but not too much later, we decided to, to act. And... We weren't, so nobody said who we were except for, so uh, Avsa uh, agreed to be the, um, uh, uh, the face of, of this uh, of this white hat attack because uh, he didn't want, uh, and he was writing that to, um, so Avsa, Alex van der, van der Sand, uh, that he didn't want people to think, okay, that's another black hat. Uh, so I don't remember, he wrote a Reddit post that the DAO is being safely drained or something like this. And people were saying, what? Uh, why should we believe you? Who are you guys? And and all that, but we drained basically the rest uh, back then. And Alex back then was with um, the Ethereum Foundation, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. And he, I mean, he later co-founded ENS, but uh, yeah. So I think he was at the Ethereum Foundation at the time. And then, kind of the other people who were involved were um, uh, Griff, obviously Christoph and his brother, and uh, Stefan Tual and Jordi. So it uh, it depends, like um, like uh, Stefan Twal, uh, Christoph, uh, and uh, Simon Jens were the three founders of of Slokit. Yeah. Uh, Jordi uh, helped with the um, uh, he didn't help so much with the first white hat attack, but later there was a lot more, and he he basically helped uh, a lot in the in the aftermath of there was quite a few more stuff that happened afterwards. Super cool. I recently found some um, sa some DAO ETH um, and I kind of, I, I hung on to it kind of just as kind of like a reminder for, for, for old time's sake. <laughs> yeah, the DAO tokens, they are um, um, kind of a collector's, uh, collector's edition. Absolutely. Fantastic. So, um, and the kind of the entire drama um, actually led to the split um, of Ethereum and Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. What did you think about this at the time? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a, uh, a hard question because I, 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 I was much more in the camp of uh, let's do the DAO wars and the soft fork and let's try to get it somehow through through counterhacking the hacker. We had so many nice plans. I even gave a, a talk about this in. What was it like? Le Nuit du Hack in Disneyland Paris in July. Oh, like wow. I, 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 I had like these nice slides and all of them explaining what we can do, etc. But it turned out that the soft fork was uh, infeasible as an idea because you could. We had the idea of kind of uh, making it so that all the miners agreed to um, uh, throttle the transactions that would be sent by the attacker. Um, Left Harris, maybe let's let's kind of clear up the term soft fork here. So we, we all know what a hard fork is, where kind of the network splits, and in a soft fork, a soft fork kind of like some transactions are censored, right? Exactly, exactly. So the um, uh, the idea was that there would be some kind of uh, um, uh, agreement with with the majority of the miners to censor transactions uh, that would be sent by the attacker uh, and to favor ours. Um, 
But the problem with that is that it actually allows the network to be DDoSed. And there was one more problem that I don't remember. And so it was infeasible as an idea at the end. Um, and otherwise, the DAO wars would just end up in an infinite hacking and anti-hacking thing, allowing probably the, the funds to um, never be recovered by the guy, by, by the attacker, but also by anybody else. And it didn't make sense. So it was either at the end to accept the loss uh, or to do the uh, the hard fork that led to Ethereum Classic. I assume if something similar were to happen today, um, maybe the decision would would have been made differently. Um, but at the time, do you think kind of with them, the two remaining choices left, so kind of either kind of just giving up the funds um, or kind of uh, doing the hard fork, um, do, do you think the right choice was made? Looking at the aftermath, I hate what happened for the next year or years with the Ethereum Classic and how the community split. This was this was pretty bad. Um, at the time, I felt that probably we shouldn't do the hard fork because from a completely personal point of view, I only had, I don't know, 100 or $200 on, inside the DAO and I, I could just lose it. But also from the point of view where uh, you know, you felt responsible, like I, I felt responsible and probably also the others in, in, in Slokit and in, in, um, uh, in the team felt responsible for, for the loss of, of funds. Um, it was a relief because then you wouldn't have to feel, okay, all these people lost money for us. So I was really, I was really torn between those, those two and I still am. Ideologically, I didn't like it. That, that is, that is, that's quite true. I didn't like it, but, um, it kind of also proved that it's not all about the code, uh, but it's also about the social consensus of Ethereum. Uh, if something like that happened right now, I have no idea what would happen. Which we, we are getting the question right now, right? What if there is a gap? If Lido get if if Lido gets hacked or something? Yeah. No, the, the, this thing that is right now in Twitter about the minority bug. Uh, sorry, oh, majority. Yeah. The super yeah, majority yeah. client bug. I mean, that could burn more. Not 15, but 25 right now percent. No, wait. 25 is staked. And if 84% of the 25 is in Geth, let's say that all of it would burn. The worst um, case, that would be 20% of all Ether. What would happen in that case? Well, <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. Like, as you said, there weren't too many... Uh, uh, applications back then. Right now, there is so much, and there is so much capital inside uh, the ecosystem to just burn um, twenty percent of the ETH that o is also backing a lot of the LSTs and the DeFi, and what that will do to the, to the price of ETH. Um, I really don't know if that it would be acceptable. Let's say. Let, let, let's let's hope we don't find out. Yes, yes. I, so basically one of my, 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 my main things when I see the current situation is like um, like we should not even have to question this. We, sh we shouldn't be in a place where a bug can actually get us to that. Yeah, absolutely. So you spend probably the longest eight months of, of your life at Slocket. Uh, I'm sure you kind of aged like by 10 years or something. Um, and then kind of just after the hack, you actually moved to BrainBot. Um, which um, was a company. So basically at the time you were working on Raiden, um, which was kind of posited as a payments channel um, for, for Ethereum. So basically back then we kind of distinguished between, um, uh, between uh, uh, state channels and uh, oh, yeah. So basically, yeah. So basically it was meant to address kind of the scaling slash interoperability space. Um, and Brainbot was very much at the forefront of that, um, but then somehow completely missed the boat later. So kind of when it actually took took off. Tell us about your time at at Brainbot, who were hugely involved in the space, right? So basically, you guys developed one of the clients. There were kind of the, you guys were kind of involved deeply with the Ethereum Foundation. There were quite a number of um, different projects you kind of did in house. Yeah, so basically tell us about your time there and where you think kind of it it went wrong and ultimately failed. Yeah, sure. So um, one correction, I didn't go to Brainbot after the hack. I um, 
the, the longest period that I spent and the worst was basically from the hack until September because that was the the really complicated stuff where there were attacks in the DAO after the the, the, the hard fork because someone put money in the DAO after the hard fork by mistake. And then the whole thing with Ethereum Classic and the DAO was there because we were called to help there because there the, uh, the hard fork never happened and that was basically the entire summer. That's a very big story, uh, which you can read in Laura's, uh, Laura's book. But after that, indeed, like uh, in September, October, I, I joined uh, BrainBot and um, I joined to help with uh, building, building Raiden, basically. Uh, so Raiden uh, was, as you said, the payment channel solution, right? So wh what is payment channels? Um, if anybody knows Lightning, uh, the Lightning network to Bitcoin is what um, Raiden is to Ethereum. The idea is extremely simple, that you take stuff off-chain and it's just for payments. And you say, uh, like, let's say, uh, I have a payment channel with, with you, Friterike, and I just send you... Um, uh, so we deposit in this payment channel, which is a contract. I deposit 10 ETH, you deposit 10 ETH, and then we can send those 10 ETH to each other as much as we want off-chain. And if ever there is a problem, we just settle it on-chain. Yeah, so basically you would actually have to sign each transaction. We just wouldn't put it on-chain. And then basically if you kind of, if you were to dupe me or whatever, uh, I could kind of prove this because I kind of had your signed transaction, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's a network because it's not just between us two. So this is a single payment channel. And it's a network because uh, then you may have one with, with, with Martin and then Martin has one with uh, uh, Christoph, let's say, and then I can send directly to Christoph through all of your channels. So um, we spent quite a bit of time developing this. <laughs> now, why did it ultimately fail? I don't know. I like the, I still like the idea of payment channels, but not as an entire network to to be used uh, as an L2 solution. Like it's it's a different it's a different thing. Um, as we see now from the rollups, you want the the full EVM experience to be uh, scalable. So you have the, the contracts, you have the DeFi. This would be only for token transfers from to someone. One of the reasons was that uh, Brainbot uh, was probably a, a very development-oriented company and not at all um, uh, user-facing. So it was mostly like some gigs just writing code. Um, so I, I think that this hurt a lot because there was no contact with, with the actual uh, community. Um, another is that it's actually a lot more complicated than it sounds to develop this. There is so many edge cases and uh, so many problems that it, it becomes very difficult to actually make this production ready. I, I remember our issues, probably they are still open, like half of them, about every single edge case that we hit or could think of. And, you know, like, it's, it's a very difficult technology to actually, to actually scale because of all these edge cases. But, I mean, you, you guys as a collective had thought so much about kind of um, the constraints and um, what had to go into it and kind of you were there for kind of like all of the um, talk about plasma and scaling and so on. So in principle, kind of like when the L2 revolution came, you were in almost the ideal place to kind of launch your own L2 and kind of make it big. Why do you think that didn't happen? I can't answer this. I really don't know because okay. um, so I wasn't in. So the problem with Brainboot is also that it wasn't. Um, uh, it was basically a top-down organization. So we had no say into what is done. There was like the the management decided, and we. I was just a developer there, and we just did what the management said. I think that we missed the boat for uh, as a project because it was too slow to finish Raiden, and then there was no pivot at all, even when stuff changed, when it was obvious that there should be a change. Well, for example, at the same time, like we had the Plasma, as you said, that popped up from the generic state channels, that state channels people, which we also cooperated with, had started, they went from state channels to Plasma, and then later to, uh, uh, basically, I think it's this, a very big part of the same team that's evolved with Optimism right now. So... Um, they pivoted every time, uh, while 
well, Brainboard just stayed on on Ryzen. So f- for for this, I guess uh, the, the lack of, of 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 pivoting is what killed it. Mm. You then kind of moved on to kind of start Rodkey, which was your own baby. So as we said in the very beginning, kind of um, Rodkey is um, an accounting and portfolio tracking and management software. Why, why did you put? Uh, why why did you choose that niche? Um, for for your own startup. Good question. Uh, I don't like accounting. I hate it's. I, I hate taxes. I hate accounting. But I just needed to do them. So I didn't even want to make a startup. I just wanted to do my taxes. <laughs> well, that escalated. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I never intended to start a startup. Like it's just that. Um, I actually started this, as you can uh, see from the commits, in 2017. So two years before I left uh, Raiden. It just was a side project uh, helping me submit my taxes to the Finanza. In the beginning, it was just a, a command line interface. And the question came in 2017 when I first realized that we have to actually, you know, submit taxes on all this stuff back from 2014, 2015, etc. And I was thinking, so how can I do this? I had no idea. Um, And I think back then, the only thing that was um, available was Bitcoin.tax. And I go there, you know, Bitcoin.tax, what is it? Okay, website, uh, you know, upload CSV or give me all of your addresses. And I'm like, wait, why should I give you the addresses? Can't I just download something and calculate it all locally and then send it to an accountant or uh, to the finance directly? And... The lack of such a tool existing is what pushed me to create Rotkey as a command line interface, basically, in the beginning to just, you know, locally calculate everything and not share it with, I don't know, someone else. Because then they know, you know, it's it's not like it's not like with um, with banks. Uh, with uh, crypto, it's a lot more sensitive because you are sharing your uh, transactions and with them your addresses. So everything you have and because everything is so public, everything you will ever have in crypto, unless you use Tornado or you go through Kraken or Coinbase. Because someone who actually really wants to follow you, they can just take all this and then just monitor what you are doing like years later while you wanted to do your tax report in, I don't know, 2017. Uh, so that I, I consider it like extremely sensitive data and I never wanted to share this. So this is how I started working on, on, on Rotkey. And there's now quite a suite of kind of um, competitors, right? So basically there's um, mo- most of those you actually use by still inputting your addresses in a um, centralized framework and they kind of calculate things for you. Um, but, and you are definitely sharing your data w- with them. Um, do you think kind of the space has professionalized in terms of kind of like data security and data privacy, or do you think it's still as dire? It's 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 a lot worse. Like instead of having one way to suit yourself on the foot, now there's a hundred ways to suit yourself on the foot. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's really bad. Uh, I'm actually very sad that I so I don't consider any of them actual competitors because nobody does what we do. I would love to have a competitor. Like a lo- Actually, there is one called, called Ghostfolio, I think. It was shown by one of our users to us. I think it's more more UK-focused uh, or something something like that. But there was one that had exactly the same ideas, uh, pro- but written in a different language or something. And uh, But um, they had uh, basically exactly the same problem and same idea. And I... I if I could say that anybody's competitor, it would be someone who offers the same thing that we offer, which is basically privacy and keeping it uh, keeping it local. Yeah, so I started it like that, but I never actually wanted to make a, a, a startup, as I said. I don't know what happened. It's just that uh, after having um, to leave uh, a Brainbot, I just thought, you know what? I So there were many problems. I don't want to go into that. But after that, I was like, I would like to work for myself. So what do I have? And I'm like, okay, I have Rodhi. And by then it had, uh, you know, quite a few like actual users and even paying users. Um, and I was like, wait, uh, I have never made a startup, so maybe I should try that. And just started it. Uh, 
along with um so even though he's not a co-founder he was basically the first dev uh, uh, a friend of mine and a quite good developer uh, who is doing the front end in in um uh, i mean he's not the only one doing the front end but he's the front end lead and lots of other stuff in 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 rotk what are the main challenges um behind um running a tool like you guys are wow where can i start <laughs> okay there seem to be a lot of challenges pick choose, choose any choose anywhere you want <laughs> Probably the biggest one would be um, the choice of uh, being local and privacy preserving actually limits you a lot in the development uh, processes. So like um, while every other um, tool that offers similar uh, solutions to, to a user, they can just have a website, right? And then in the website, they just uh, roll out an update and then another update. You don't need to download anything. You don't need to do anything. It's just auto-updated. It is a problem both for our users and for us. It's really, really annoying that when you make a local application, you have to create binaries. People have to download them. And it's not just that you have to create binaries. You have to create binaries for Windows. You have to create binaries for uh, Linux, for many different distros. Then for Apple, Mac OS X stuff. Then later when the Silicon stuff came, this is a different binary because it's a completely different architecture. So you need to have you know two binaries for, for Apple. Um, so developing uh, local software Though it's, um, I believe as a user, it has a lot of benefits. Um, as a developer, it's a pain in the behind, right? Because I, like, like it, 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 it takes, it, basically it costs more money in the end because it's more dev resources, more time, uh, while you just make a website and you just update it. So it, uh, this is probably one of the biggest challenges. The other would be, But this is something that everybody shares. So I have talked also with founders of, of um, or, or developers of uh, other tools that are uh, you know completely online. When you want to track crypto, uh, I mean, there is a new protocol or a new primitive, completely new idea popping up every week or so. And the users are extremely uh, demanding. And they are also very entitled. Like they are like, wait, why doesn't it track this protocol that only I know uh, very well? Why doesn't it do this? So trying to keep up with with crypto and its developments um, in this in the, this field is so fast that it's it's extremely difficult. Yeah, I ca I can see that. You guys have a free tier and a pay tier. So how does it work? Kind of what um, as a user, um, what can I do with um, the free tier, and uh, from which point onwards do I actually have to pay? Yeah. So uh, the free tier, uh, so this tiering will change because it's um, unsustainable. The free tier is way too cheap. <laughs> it's 12, uh, no, actually 10 euros per month plus VAT, wherever you are. Because, for example, for Germany, we have to start 19% uh, uh, VAT. If you are in Portugal, a different one. If you are not in the European zone, it's 10 euros. We've gotten feedback that you can get a lot done with the free version and that we should actually change that in order to get more money from users. But the... It has limits. So it has limits on the amount of events that you can uh, um, uh, process. So if you have more than, uh, I don't know, a thousand or something, then uh, or 500, I don't remember, you will see a, a notice saying, okay, we can't process more than this. Uh, please upgrade to the, um, um, uh, to the uh, premium version. And there is some uh, features uh, that we have also in the premium version, like uh, at staking, I think. And another one is that we allow... And this is one of the features that people really like for premium. We allow to up, uh, upload your database to our server and then download it from another machine. And this is completely private because the database, so all of the data in, in Erotki is encrypted using a password that you give. So we, we just see a blob of data. We can't read it. We just act as a cloud where you upload the thing and then you download it somewhere else. You also said that um, you don't just do accounting and... Um, portfolio tracking, you will also start much doing much more portfolio management. How does that look like? So Rotkey right now is, is, is mostly a tracker, right? Uh, an accounting tool. Um, there is many ways that you can take it, but we're a really small team, so we are, we, we are resource constrained. You can either try to do a lot more accounting. Um, you know, there's so many jurisdictions. This is another 
from, from the <laughs> another one of the problems because uh, people say, okay, I want to do accounting, right? But I am in the Netherlands, so I have these rules. Please help me. Or I'm in the UK. I have the bed and breakfast rule. What is that? Oh, here, read it. It's, uh, you know, uh, the HRM website, you know, a PDF of 100 pages. Please implement it. I'm a premium user. I'm paying 10 euros per month. Please, I want this implemented from you. Uh, so it starts getting extremely difficult because the really is every country has its own rules. So we try to have generic accounting, customizable a bit, as an accounting solution um, um, approach. And we want to make it configurable for users and users can make PRs even and, and add their stuff. But for management side, it's including myself as a user and other users have told us, so I open Rotki, I see what I have in Kraken, in Coinbase or in, um, uh, in DeFi. Why can't I actually manage it from Rotki? Uh, Rotki has the Kraken API keys. It has the Coinbase API keys. If I want to make a trade in Kraken to sell uh, F4 Euro, why can't I do it from Rotki? Why do I have to open Kraken, sign in, put my 2FA, and not do it from 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 Rotki? So the idea is to actively manage your funds um, by making um, both on-chain transactions and um, uh, trading on uh, the exchanges from Rotki. This is not possible yet, but this is the direction that we would like to take it uh, towards because um, it would make it a uh, well, much more useful tool for, for everybody. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. And I think it's also something that a lot of um, portfolio trackers kind of uh, um, a path that they have taken also to kind of increase monetization, right? Th that's, that's true. Like um, for other portfolio trackers, um, uh, this is mostly for DeFi only because they are like DeFi oriented. Yeah. But yes, indeed, they they turn into wallets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so since you started this, there have been enormous developments in the privacy sphere, right? So basically, um, back in 2017, when you kind of started this as a CLI project, um, there was no ZKPs. And now kind of we're talking about fully homomorphic encryption. Right? Do you think um, these um, cryptographic tools could help build something that is um, easier to maintain, um, but still fully private for the user? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know the technical details of uh, ZK piece uh, enough to, to answer. Okay. What what are the plans for the future for Rotkey? Yeah, um, so the plans for the future is to basically um, capitalize on on uh, having a local tool uh, by um, going towards the management side. Because another thing is like you you wouldn't share your your uh, API keys, uh, active API keys with with a, with an exchange uh, with, with a centralized website. People have done it once at this three commas thing. And if you've read, like, the, they had this trading API where you had a, um, um, what was it, like some kind of um, website where it, it aggregates trades from different exchanges. It's called three commas. And they got hacked because, and they lost a lot of money from the customers because they their database got hacked. So active API keys were leaked and boom. While with Rotkit, it would all be locally, okay, you Someone can put a keylogger on your machine, but then it's 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 your fault. It's not someone leaking your data uh, and with it access to your funds. So we really want to capitalize on 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 this a lot. Keep offering um, more accounting solutions because this is probably one of the things that our current users want the most. And figure out a way to um, well allow for easier um, so to capitalize on the open source part. Allow for uh, easier contributions, and maybe also incentivize them somehow. Uh, because uh, if we as a, as a project do good, so maybe also our contributors could could uh, somehow profit. So we're thinking of, of ways that we could uh, uh, we could achieve this. And uh, change the architecture of, of the tool, again, capitalizing on the local um, part. Uh, so make it uh, multi-processing. We want to, we, we are working on different demons underneath doing other things. Because it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, a backend and a frontend, and 
it's doing so many things, so many calculations underneath uh, that it's already at the limits of the current process and it's slow in many things. So we want to basically go to a multi-service architecture and some services written in um, a different languages and we're looking at, uh, at, at Trust right now in order to, well, I mean, my computer has how many cores and I run Rotkey on, on a one Python backend. I mean, you know how Python is a is, is single um, uh, process. Though this is changing with newer versions of Python, um, still we want to go to a multi-service architecture to get rid of these uh, these limitations. Cool. Yeah, no, that's super super interesting to hear kind of what the plans for Rotkey going forward are. Um, maybe let's let's um, kind of change gears a little bit and talk about Ethereum culture and the general ecosystem. So. You have been in the ecosystem for 10 years. You, you, you kind of joined in 2014, now it's 2024. How has, how has the culture changed in your eyes? So we grew a lot, right? So I don't know what to call Ethereum culture uh, anymore. It's so many people um, compared to how it was before. It's so many new people. and We have different subcultures right now inside Ethereum. We have the regions, the degens, uh, the, 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 the traders, the gamblers, I don't know, like the builders. And then we have the builders who are okay. You know, we don't need open source. Let's go close source. We have the builders who are like uh, like me, like open source. We have others who are like, okay, maybe let's go somewhere in between. So there is, there is it's so big as, a, as an ecosystem right now. And I'm very happy and proud of that, that I can't really define what is... Um, what is Ethereum culture anymore? It's just a lot of subcultures. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's uh, yeah, that's that's a very fair point. If you kind of think about kind of like the Ethereum OGs from back then, so I recently saw again the picture from DevCon Zero, and as you said, as you said, there were literally like twenty five people there. Um, of those, there are very few um, left over. Do you think that's kind of like natural churn? Um, and people are just doing something else now, or do you think it's something that's particular to to this ecosystem? And is there anyone you miss in particular? Anyone you you really wish would come back? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, wow, well, from Demco Zero. Yeah, I don't know. I like, I loved uh, Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Weekly, the um, basically main, uh, the first developer of, of, of Keith. He's a really cool guy. Um, if I were to say anybody from 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 that picture that I just just, just remembered, um, as for the turn, it's he's logical. He's completely though. out out of the ecosystem, yeah. right? He does completely yeah. out, completely out. Like the only time that I saw his name was when someone accused him of selling ETH in order to fund his. Uh, I think he's uh, doing a game right now, like a software game. And uh, some because they tracked his uh, Ethereum address from. But in Genesis, and they, uh, you know, try to name shame him in Twitter for for selling ETH. Bastard, kind of selling the ETH that legally belongs to him. Yes. How yes. dare he? <laughs> what? <laughs> maybe we were talking about maybe a year or two ago. So, yeah, there is definitely a natural turn. I mean, people being ten years older, if if you are now at forties or fifties, I mean, at some point you're like, okay, you know, middle age crisis. Some get married, some get kids. Uh, the turn is, is natural. Uh, on the other hand, there is also something that most of the people there, if they actually had ETH and kept it, probably don't need to care about anything anymore. So maybe this also shows um, who was interested in it for just, you know, like, okay, let's just make something cool, but make money and then retire. Um and uh, who is still here and is just building because this is something really interesting. And I mean, th this uh, thing that we're building is really interesting. And the people who still are here in one way or another, um, I, I find it really, really nice. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's always good to kind of run into old faces. Yeah. You're a very active tweeter um, on Twitter. Um, and the things kind of you cover a lot are kind of like things like privacy and free speech, kind of tornado style kind of projects, um, but also security. 
you're also pretty big in the Ethereum public goods and protocol governance scene. Um, so you're one of the largest delegates for um, a number of projects. Um, how how do you choose which issues to get involved in and what makes you passionate about them? Yeah, that's a good question. I I never planned to actually become a, as they call it, DAO politician or governance politician. Or I have no idea how that's happened, really. I, <laughs> I, I really have no idea. Uh, for example, it turns out that I'm the biggest delegate in DIVA. And they do a distri distributed um, staking validation protocol, right? Uh, exactly. I have no idea how. Like someone told me, hey, do you know that you're a delegate in DIVA? I said, uh, yeah, I remember that I said, okay, if anybody wants to delegate to me, do that. And then someone tells me, hey, can you come to this telegram? We need you to vote because you're the biggest delegate. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> but everyone knows you, right? Because you're so active on Twitter and kind of you seem... Uh, I know I've delegated to you in the past because kind of you you, you seem to kind of think think uh, things out well and you know I I don't have bandwidth to kind of look into all of these things and I know that kind of if if you kind of looked into it um, I would probably end up agreeing with you so kind of I think this is these are the reasons for which people delegate right probably probably yeah. It started probably with ENS and Gitcoin, I guess, because Gitcoin is something that I really love. I, I stopped actually being a delegate there because of uh, issues with the governance. I just said, okay, I don't want it anymore. I'm just too tired. Um, but things um, that try to change the world, uh, like like Gitcoin, because I, I find it amazing that it can basically, it has so many flaws. I have criticized it as many times as I have said that I love it. But it's amazing that you have this idea where, okay, you gather people from all around the world and you fund projects and then there is a matching pot and these projects get more funding from from the pot. And we have funded with this uh, even things outside of crypto. Like I tweeted the other day about URLib3, which is a, a very basic um, uh, library in Python. Uh so it's it's really amazing to see how these primitives that we have created in uh, in, in in crypto can help people build uh, amazing stuff and fund them. So I guess that's how I got into it. Just wanted to well influence its its direction. How much time does it take up for you? Because kind of like following like other forums, I'm involved in way fewer. Um, projects and even I struggle to kind of keep up I don't follow forums as, as much as people probably think um, uh, if if, if uh, governance relies on uh, needing to follow forums I probably don't like or, or like step 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 away from that particular uh, project so uh, actively actively I think I'm mostly in optimism uh, in ENS this is probably the most uh, active ones that I I, I, I I am active in right now um, and one really cool thing that I have asked of every DAO that I am involved in I'm also involved in HOP a bit etc is it's to get delegates having a mailing list so like what happened like we, we weekly sum up this is beautiful because I can just go through it and say okay that's it good good info it's, 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 it's a game changer are, are these published somewhere? Uh, yeah, I think I think everybody can um, just like with a many mailing list, right? You can subscribe and oh, then you nice. you, you yeah. get it. I think okay. so. It's ENS not just for delegates. One. No, 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 no. It's like um, okay. the governance weekly or something like that. Okay, and it's yeah. it's pretty it's pretty helpful if you're a delegate because then you actually can know what's happening without having to be on the forums every time. And then you see, okay, so this particular um, uh, proposal. Is something that I should look at, but it, it, it does take time, and unfortunately, uh, some things take a lot more time than they should. Like, um, so ENS, for example, it's it's pretty smooth. Like, it's they have this um, uh, sub uh, groups or working groups. Uh, they are the most. They are mostly running the DAO, and then they are asking the delegates to to vote on stuff. And when there is a big vote, that's when a lot of thinking needs to happen. Like uh, there was now with the service providers. But mostly it's hands off. Optimism is so much work. I, I don't know what the heck I'm doing there. It's like 
so much work. Are delegates compensated for their for their time? No, and this is another problem that. Uh, so ENS, I mean, it's too little. It's it's not too much work, but the, like there is the bursts of work. Optimism is is really a lot of work. Um, they say that they don't want to so for optimism they don't want to uh, compensate, but maybe there will be retro PDF. So they have this kind of bait of sorts to get people more interested in governance. But for me, it would be much better if it was like, okay, so this is the hours I put and this is how much I get compensated, not like retro PCF, because it's it's a different, it's a, I think they're, they're completely different things. This, this it shouldn't work like this because it really takes a lot of time. Um, optimism is, I, I find really cool and annoying at the same time because, uh, so optimism has the foundation behind it and it's not hands-off, it's very hands-on. So this is something that I don't like. It, some a, lo a lot of the times it feels like decentralization theater as opposed to like actual governance. They are taking feedback well and they are changing it. They're really trying. Uh, they have voting cycles, they have seasons, and every time it gets better and better. Still hands-on. The question would be, if Optimism Foundation wasn't actually guiding this, would it, would it be chaos? Maybe it's better this way? I I I I, I don't know. Optimism does it in an interesting way. The most cool thing about optimism, and something that I find really interesting, is that they have a bicameral or bi chamber governance. So they call it the token house and the citizen house. The token house is the usual delegates. People will delegate up to someone, and these are the token house delegates. Then there is the citizen house, which is supposed to um, fight um, the um, plutocracy by uh, having recognized citizens uh, as uh, one person, one vote. Right now there is 125 people, I think. And they, in the beginning, only voted in the retro PGF. So all retro PGF rounds were actually voted only by the batch holders, so the citizens. Um, but right now, from this season, they start to have um, a voice in the actual governance too, and they can basically vet almost everything. Uh, so they try to have to experiment with this idea of, of two different chambers of governance, so that there is no power of plutocracy completely on the on on the on, on the token holders, and that cannot be captured, or if it gets captured, so that it can be saved by by the citizen house. It's a really interesting approach. I, I I find it unique and I really want to see how, how how it goes. Yeah, I think governance is it's going to there are going to be so many if this is to work, there's going to be so many upgrades. So kind of like this this one person one vote and then kind of the delegates and kind of it's kind of it's it's too easy to break and to spam and it's uh yeah, so I'm super curious to see how, how how that will go in the future. What makes you hopeful for the for the road ahead for Ethereum, and what worries you? So hopeful, hopeful, I guess. Hmm. Uh, all the cool stuff, like we're really building really cool stuff. Um, as as like I saw a tweet by Peter, and I, I kind of agreed with it. Uh, Peter from from Geth, uh, Sila Peter Silagi. Yeah, I'm not gonna try yeah. to pronounce it. Um, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry if you watch this, Peter. <laughs> um, but uh, like, I also was a bit against the EIP fifteen fifty nine because I didn't think it would work or that you know like it didn't make sense to me. But uh, you know, like I, it's a resounding success as an idea, and it yeah, shows yeah, it just, really. So EIP fifteen fifty nine was the fee market, right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Sorry, I, I yeah, I hate this when people do that and I shouldn't have done this. Like <laughs> all these numbers, you know, like you know, fifteen forty seven and forty six thirty three, and I'm like, okay, what? <laughs> yeah, I know what exactly. Is, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> yeah, so the fee market um, one it has worked amazingly. So I think that it's probably this also goes back to the people. So like the there is so many smart people in this field. Uh, there's so many people smarter than me, younger, um, talented, and you know, hungry for 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 building beautiful stuff. Uh, I think that this is the hope. Like all this new 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 generation that is inside this um, ecosystem that we built back then, uh, 
it's this is making me extremely hopeful for the future. It's it's really beautiful to see all those um, young people trying to build cool stuff. Ah, and also the um, how generous people are about uh, helping good causes. Like now with the tornado, right? You see how um, both back when it was just Alexei Pertsev's case, but now with that it's both cases with Pertsev and Roman in the U.S. Um, how everybody just you know opens up and says, okay, yeah, let's donate, let, let, let's help um, defend open source, and defend privacy. So these kind of reactions and these kind of people in the field really make me uh, extremely hopeful and proud to, to be to be part of this ecosystem. I love the way that you frame the kind of what makes you hopeful because I think kind of like young and smart people in the ecosystem, I, I think you're spot on. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 amazing. It's it's really cool to yeah. see. And people who are still in it for the right reasons, right? So basically, I mean, intermittently, we always kind of have these phases where there's a lot of money bros. Um, but uh, yeah, by and large, they're still they're still the people who are in it because they just believe in the vision. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, for 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 what worries me, I guess a lot of things again, <laughs> like. <laughs> Super majority of 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 Gith of Gith in in uh, in stating this this I had totally forgotten about it and now that it became a Twitter thing again uh, I'm like oh wow that's really serious that really worries me like I the moment I realized that it's so bad I I'm really worried about this so things like that like they call it a Black Swan event but it's not really a Black Swan if you actually talk about it and expect that it may happen. If you can I, I, see it coming, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I find it weird that you would call it a Black Swan event. But also, you know, the other thing would be um, the image that we have um, towards um, the outside. Um, this saddens me maybe more than worries me, but also worries me because this image... Um, so we, 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 we tend to have a very negative image, right? Outside of the crypto space, they just somehow associate us only with crime or um, uh, scams or um, uh, gambling, uh, you know, very negative words. Uh, while in reality, it's, it's not it's not like that. Uh, though there is a lot of scams, a, a lot of um, bad stuff in, in crypto for sure. It's... Uh, like de developers uh, that are just working in other non-crypto fields seem to actually hate developers working in crypto. Like there is a lot of actual hate. I have been attacked in, in let's say, issues in GitHub when they realized, so, you know, reporting a, a library issue somewhere and then they realize that I work in crypto and they are extremely, uh, like, unkind, tell me to, you know, get off, uh, that they don't want to help me. I have had this happen multiple times and, I mean, this... I find it extremely worrying because this translates later into what we see in the political scene in the US. Because if many people associate something with, with crime, um, then they can push it to be banned or to have, um, uh, well, a lot of political consequences. And this, this uh, actually really worries me because the misinformation there can do a lot of damage to, to, to our sector. And it's often strongest in groups that should in principle be values aligned with us. So kind of like the, the people who kind of came out from the original cypherpunk, so kind of like the CCC in, in Germany or the Electronic Frontier Foundation, almost everyone is extremely Web3 critical. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel you. I also, f I also find that very worrying. Yes, 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 exactly. I, and I don't know, you know, I normally don't worry if I have a solution and I know, okay, let's go work towards that. I don't know what to do here because I don't understand why this is happening. Okay, no, I mean, I can understand why. Yeah, I also understand why. So basically, I think kind of like being on the inside, um, there's a lot of scams that we're not even privy to. So basically, that kind of like regular people um, are the target audience for, and we don't even... Um, we'd never actually end up hearing about. So there was like this runaway hit podcast, um, I think 
made by the BBC last week, uh, last year, the the crypto queen or something. And I had it was literally a project that the had apparently Bulgarian raised, lady, right? Yeah, exactly. Had apparently raised billions of dollars, and I had literally never heard of her, like zero times. So I think kind of we're kind of like we're very much in this bubble um, where there are um, largely well-intentioned people. And kind of like all of this scammy underbelly of crypto, we're not privy to it. So I think probably for every legitimate project that we know and love, there's uh, 20 scam projects that we've never heard of. And I think this is very much kind of how this image of crypto actually arises. And I think kind of the way to kind of dig ours, dig ourselves out of this hole, I hope, is by building genuinely useful application for regular people and i think kind of this is kind of where we ne where, where as an ecosystem kind of we need to get to right yeah yeah that's uh that's that's true but i don't know how to get there because even if we do like we have we have we have a lot of stuff like i mean the, okay now uh, like advertising is something that you guys work on in gnosis like the gnosis pay right like this is amazing this is gonna be super cool based on, on Monerium, which I have actually also used, right? And this, these are really, like, the, the payments, uh, unlocking payments, it's... it's. Uh... Yeah, but it's still, it's, it's still a promise, right? So basically, it still hasn't found... I mean, it's... So, kind of, we're very hard at work to kind of make it usable for anyone who's kind of on a regular new bank account. Um, so maybe not for your grandmother, but kind of for for kind of regular people our age um, who have no crypto background should be usable without them having to know kind of what a seed phrase is and so on. Um, but we are not there yet. So kind of if you kind of look at actual users in crypto, kind of people who are there to kind of use the products because they are legitimately better than the Web2 equivalent, I would, uh, there's, I think there's literally zero. And I think kind of moving from a place, I think I'm super hopeful we can we can get there and we can get there maybe this year or next year, uh, basically having real applications with um, real users who are not in it because it's crypto and it's cool, but because it's better than what they used to have. Um, I think we can get there. Um, and I think this is this will have to be the way to kind of get out of this, you know, public relations nightmare that we're in at the moment. Yeah, yeah. The, we, we need to find, like, well, not exactly find PMF, but it would be nice to have a good um, good applications. But I, I still think that there is stuff that uh, crypto does a lot better than anything else right now, which is, I mean, payments. It's, it's Nothing can do this as well as crypto. I like paying people in um, outside of the EU paying people in Africa. So we have some uh, independent contractors in Rotki that work some hours for us, right? And we pay them through through crypto. Uh, if you try to pay and uh, Africa sometimes, Asia also, right? Yeah. So we tried even uh, with, um, I don't know what other solutions are there, like PayPal or, or Wise Transfer. And wise, yeah. We, we tried Wise. Oh my God. It's, first of all, so slow, then expensive, the percentage on the amount. And the second payment that we tried to send, it took about a month because it got somehow flagged and then we had to talk with support and... Look, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. I totally agree. But I think kind of then kind of if you look at the other side, the question is kind of like, how do you off-ramp it? How do you, how do you make the stables accessible so that you can actually spend them for groceries and your rent? And I think this is still way too hard. So I think kind of, yeah, I mean, I think kind of, it's potential improvement is definitely there and i think we can get there but i think kind of making it more usable i think this kind of needs to be kind of like priority one for now yeah yeah for for countries like for asian countries from what i i, I heard they just use you know like exchanges like like i i do normally for for off ramping in africa it's extremely interesting they use this like p2p stuff they they just do crypto p2p just like we used to do not so much anymore, like uh, local Bitcoins and local Ethereum. Yeah, local Bitcoins. That was, uh, that was a fun time. Yeah, cool. Um, Left Harris, it's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you and have you on this podcast for the first time for real 
after 10 years of kind of working together. Where, if people are interested in trying out RoughKey or contributing, where should, you, where should we send them? So for contributing, it would be um, a GitHub and Discord. So GitHub to see the code and Discord to uh, basically chat with us, ask us any questions. We are, we're uh, extremely welcome to uh, contributors. And to download it, uh, you can also download it from GitHub, but we have it on our website, like rotkey.com. You can just uh, go there and press download, depending on the... It will probably detect your operating system and then download the proper uh, binary and just try it and then come to Discord and... Tell us what you think. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on, Left Harris, and see you soon. Yeah, thank you so much.